Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. It's August 31st, 2023, and it is a beautiful day. Uh, perfect temperature, no humidity, a slight breeze, nice blue skies. So I decided I'm gonna take care of the going through this pick uh, with you guys out here in the backyard. So uh, this is a pick from the summer tractor show back in July. And I'm just getting around to cataloging everything right now so I can uh, resell a lot of this stuff. So, in typical fashion with most of my picks, they involve a lot of machinist items, machinist tools. However, I did also decide to pick up a few chainsaws. And there's even a couple of vintage electronic items, as I often am tempted by those, if the deal is really good. Which they were. All right, first buy of the day was from a dealer who had a um, bunch of junk tools and stuff, but I dug through the piles and found these three items. Uh, this is an old brown and sharp micrometer. Uh, still actually seems to work, even the lock works, sort of. Good carbide faces on it that don't look trashed. So I got that. This last word indicator, which uh, we'll call it as is, because it's sticky as heck, but it's not completely broken. And this hunk of steel for five bucks. Which normally I wouldn't bother with the steel, but I knew I would throw it in. He would really <clears throat> make it much more expensive. Uh, five bucks for this nice pair of parallel clamps. Uh, I've seen this style before. I do not recall the brand on this one. So this one looks like I don't know if this was damaged and welded a long, long time ago. Um, but there is a name on these. I think it's Billings or something like that of, uh, looks like Hartford, Connecticut. Oh well, whatever. Nice set of clamps for five bucks. Three bucks for this little clamp on vice. There's a number on it. But other than that, no identification. Might be an import. And then I got this brown and sharp, this very early brown and sharp gauge block set that is in pretty rough shape. It's missing quite a few pieces. So you can see it's 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 got issues. Oh, that's interesting. That's one of those half round ones. So you might be wondering why did I even bother with this? Well, because it was five bucks. <laughs> so for five bucks, it might be worth it to somebody that might just be missing a block or two. From one of my uh, dealers that I frequent, I see at a lot of different shows, he didn't have too much along the way of uh, machinist tools for me, but I was able to pick up these three items here. We've got a uh, Sterrett automatic center punch that seems to work perfectly fine, a uh, Sterrett scriber, I believe it's a Sterrett scriber, and uh, I got the, uh, I turn these around so that they don't poke through and hurt you, because they are sharp. And this little new old stock, Norton Stone, it is a India medium stone, but it's uh, actually brand new in the box. Ten bucks for those three items. I don't even remember which dealer I came across that had this. This is the only machinist item he had. It's a Sterrett pin vise and size D, and uh, I got that for a buck. From the same guy I got that blue vise from, I also got this vise for five, uh, I think for three dollars. And it's a very unusual looking one. And I have now discovered that I believe when I look this up, that it turns out that it might actually be a nutcracker of all things. So it's got a uh, concave area here and a concave area here. And this is made by the Malleable Fittings Company of Looks like Branford, Connecticut. I don't think I've ever heard of that town. I don't know, that's what I get for not wearing my glasses while I'm out here. And on this side, it just says perfection. So I believe this is the perfection nutcracker that I thought was some sort of specialty vice. So I have no idea what that's worth, but I paid three bucks for it. Some guy had just this lone machinist parallel clamp. Probably somebody picked through and bought all the clamps and missed this one. It seized up, but I got it for two bucks, and I think I did see a name on this one. Well, maybe not. That's no, engraved. Yeah, this is this actually underneath all of this garbage here. This is a Sterrett 
this actually still has some of the case hardening uh, visible on it so this was actually a nice clamp at one point in its life I got these three items all together for ten dollars uh, this is a uh, Huat drill index fractional sizes and it actually has quite a few drill bits still in it some of the smaller sizes missing off and those are the ones that get broken didn't even happen to look and see not gonna look at every single one but just randomly that that one's marked hungry as is that one yep looks like these are all marked hungry or the most of for the most part the larger ones are and then also that ten dollars included these two uh, vintage SWR meters this one says it's the realistic CB tester this is all metal this case so this is going to be a pretty early one it's got kind of a neat looking meter that's in what looks like like it's still in great shape um, so this is for testing RF power output SWR which is typical on these but this one also has a modulation meter which uh, you don't see on a lot of these and it looks like maximum power scale is 10 watts and of course legal power output on CB radio AM was 4 watts so that's typical what you see on these and then this one is I've never heard of this brand before this is a tempo a tempo RBF1 um, so this is a power and SWR and what I like about this one that caught my eye is that the watt meter goes up to 20 watts on this one it's made in Japan this says that according to the switch this changes the range from 200 watts to 2 kilowatts well that can't be right there's no way I mean this thing's got a little bit of weight to it but there's no way that there's a 2 kW dummy load inside this thing so they must be intending for you to run this into a dummy load through the output here and use it as a two kilowatt watt meter well, that's interesting so how the heck are you supposed to use it to measure low wattage if full scale at 20 is 200 watts according to this switch huh all right same guy I got that deal from I got this entire box of 5c collets yeah they're old yeah they've got a lot of residue to put it nicely on them but what I noticed was randomly pulling them out these are all good US made collets. that's a PNW so that's a Pratt & Whitney so these are old yeah these are all these are all looks like Pratt & Whitney collets these were in an old wooden plywood stand but I didn't want to take the stand with me so I just took them all out and he gave me this box to put them in and it looks like they're all fractional so. 15 for the whole lot that's a good deal I'll sell these probably for a couple bucks a piece all right moving right along uh, I picked up this interesting little antique vise from a guy for five bucks I just really like the look of it you can see it's a little sucker the whole thing fits right in my hand and it's got this little anvil area on the back you know it's kind of rough but it, it looks like a miniature version of a blacksmith leg vise almost that clamps on the way it's made so um, I don't know if I'm ever gonna be able to identify that one or, or even bother for that matter but I just kind of liked it and I think from the same dealer I ended up getting this little square which has no markings on it so it's just a little no-name but I just thought because of the size that it might be a nice little piece and I got that for five bucks again pretty small I've picked up a few of these little draw organizer things over the years here and there all different colors and styles uh, well not really styles they've always been like these little four draws but the difference is some of them the draws have different layouts so like this one's got some partitions like that that's a full open draw this one's got smaller compartments and this is long compartments it's got paint over spray on it it's got a little bit of dent here and there but I got that for two bucks so I'll buy those all day long for five dollars or less I always 
the funny thing is I know I could always sell those for more. And the funny thing is I don't think I've sold any. I, I, I just keep collecting them. That is a Huat uh, drill organizer. And it looks like heck. It's got a lot of rust on it. Um, but what I like about it is it's a letter size. So it's got the letter size drills marked on it. If you look at the inside of the draws, it's actually very clean. So wherever it was kept that ended up getting all of this rust and everything all over it didn't really affect the draws inside. They still actually operate pretty well and the best part about that is I got that for 15 bucks. So one of the guys that I bought a lot of this stuff from he had really good deals on stuff. He had an old machinist toolbox. It was in pretty rough shape and I knew that he was going to want more money for it than I wanted to pay. But I was able to convince him to let me go through and take out anything from the box that I'd be interested in, put it in a pile, and we put it all in this wooden box that he gave me. And I got everything in this box for 30 bucks. And I just basically took anything of any value out of that box for 30 bucks. So didn't leave much behind. Some of the stuff in here is no big deal, but let's go through it together and see what we got old pair of dividers, a sweet little hammer, kind of neat little sucker, very dainty little slim handle that somehow has survived all these years, got an unusual shape to it. I would say this is a jeweler's hammer maybe or like a tinsmith, tin knocker, whatever you call them actually in pretty great shape but it's just a nice neat little hammer unusual little shape to it it's actually in excellent condition too this couldn't have been used on anything too hard okay uh, looks like what we've got here is just a whole bunch of these little Allen type drivers random sizes that's an uh, Exolite quarter-inch nut driver one of the most common sizes you use in nut drivers. Oh, this is nice. This is a nice pair of tweezers. The style that are, the way they're sprung, they're actually made to lock on by themselves. Great for sorting small parts like screws and stuff in trays. We're just reaching down and retrieving something that fell into a tight spot. Ratchet socket tool. So, all right, so that's locked. I'm guessing pull up, flip it over. Oop, shaking the whole table. So that's ratcheting. So that works. I don't know if I'll ever use it. It's a standard quarter inch drive though. I could put any kind of bit in there I want. So, uh, okay. Oh, it turns out there's a couple more of these sweet little hammers in here. Look at that one. I thought the handle on that last one was dainty. Look at that sucker. Okay, next to my pinky, how thin that is. And then, that's a brass one. Kind of weird to get excited about hammers, but that's kind of a nice, nicely crafted tool. Got tapers here. Oh, uh, these plain Jane snap ring pliers, you know, they don't have great handles on them, but they actually work really well. This is a true arc plier number three. What is this? Oh, wow. This is interesting. Hmm. This would be a good one for Mr. Pete's mystery tool segment, maybe. So it appears like it's some sort of plier, but it's almost got like this double jaw deal. So I see two very, very fine points on the end there. I don't know if, I don't know if that's focusing or not, but there's two, there's two very fine points on the end. All right, so the name on this is Waldes, W-A-L-D-E-S 12, and that's the same name on this one. So th these are both Weldis True Arc pliers. This one, though, is for what is what they call Weldis retaining rings. 
And it turns out, wireless retaining rings are what I've been calling my entire life C-clips. So is it possible that this company, Waldus, is the company that invented the C-clip? Or some people call these E-clips because of that little extra little nub there. But anywho, so apparently these are supposed to help you grip the clip too also. I don't know. So, all right. Yeah, all right. So here's some more uh, snap ring pliers. And looks like I'm going to have no shortage of those. I have to go through and see what sizes I have duplicates of and get rid of some of them. Let's see what else we got here. I found another hammer. This is just a little ball and peen hammer. It looks like it might be... Oh, that's a nice little Stanley. Just a pair of needle nose pliers. Crowder? Crowter? Looks like K-R-A-E-U-T-E-R, maybe? USA? Huh. Snap clamp. Four. Nice parallel clamps. These are... These have case hardening on them. Yeah, it looks like that's a stare it looks like the match to that one and yeah two match pairs of Starrett parallel clamps a nice uh, American wire gauge number 881 Starrett little screw thing this is just a quarter inch by half inch hunk of high-speed steel this is a very early Goodell Pratt micrometer you can tell the really early ones had these very small little um, thimbles on the end and I think a lot of them probably got broken off over the years because of the fact that you can see how delicate that would be they even neck it right there so it's even thinner past the knurling and somehow this thing has survived so a good old Pratt collector might be interested in that just as a really early example here's a nice piece in the original brown and sharp box so the brown and sharp precision straight edge number 530 excellent condition I mean the thing is just clean as a whistle I've never seen one black like this it's like almost like an oxide coating on it that's a really nice find also came across these what appear to be solid brass uh, almost like some sort of anvil or something um, I'm not quite sure what these came out of if anybody recognizes what these may have been for Here's a little cap screw tool, kind of neat. This little slice of heaven is marked the uh, Eklund T&M Company, and that stands for Eklund Tool and Manufacturing Company. It's a U.S. company that was uh, founded by a couple of uh, Swedish immigrants back in 1923. And in 1948, Henning Eklund designed the company's first hex key product. Prior to that, they had made some... Uh, looks like the first commercial product they ever made was a uh, aftermarket emergency brake signal light for automobiles. This is interesting. In 1955, in 1955, the company manufactured its first fold-up hex key sets, a segment of the market that uh, Eklund dominates to this day. So Eklund still makes... Uh, so this is from the Superior Tool Company, but this style of fold-up hex key set is, I guess, what... Eklund's claim to fame was back then. So looks like they branched into other things. Um, 1951, after his service in the United States Army, Howard Eklund began his career at Eklund Tool. Okay, so that's interesting, Eklund Tool. So Eklund Tool and Manufacturing. So this must be a pretty early version of that piece. Here's a nice little Craftsman depth gauge. Not all bent up. Here's another scriber. This one's a craftsman. And let's let me turn that around. See if that's even. No, nope. that's going to take a wrench to get that undone. Another pair of these locking tweezers. This style here, you actually can unlock or lock them. Here's another no name square. Oddly enough, I bought this from a different guy. Uh, I thought it said something here, but it looks like that's just a. Maybe somebody even put their initials on there or something, but I don't see any maker's name on here, unfortunately. Unless there's something underneath all this rust. Here's a little tape measure called the Little Pal. Oh, <laughs> it's in a little rough shape. <laughs> Too bad, because that's kind of a neat little collectible if it was in excellent shape. 
this has got me a little perplexed. This this little box, I, I thought this was just some scrap metal here. That looks like an insert for a saw, maybe, or I don't know what that is. Don't know if that's just nothing. But this, what I thought was just a plain piece of metal, I noticed on the edge, it's clearly marked diamond charged. And then on this edge, carbide anvils only. So, is this like a lapping plate for micrometer anvils or something? I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know. It's an unusual piece. All right, here's a uh, screw pitch gauge. Might be sterile, I don't know. It's rusted, I can tell you that. Uh, oh, still actually moves though, so that's good. Here's a little tap wrench. That's actually kind of a nice little tap wrench. No mix that. So this little tap wrench is a Billings and Spencer. Um, and I'm not positive, but I think I could see a patent date of 1879 on this thing. That's going to be one of the earliest ones I've ever had, if it is. All right, let me show you the best piece out of this whole box for 30 bucks, and uh, then we'll look at what junk's left in the bottom of the box there. There's nothing really too exciting, but this is the best piece in there. And what this is, is this is a, a genuine Starrett uh, number 129 bench block, and it's actually in uh, excellent shape. And it's got the remnants of its original box, the Starrett 129 bench block. How cool is that? left in the bottom of the box well there's good stuff in here I mean it's not junk otherwise I wouldn't have taken it for instance like these pulley taps these are taps that are on these really long shanks for getting down into sheaves on pulleys and stuff there's some kind of a wedge for something God knows what several punches probably all US made because early enough to be US made here is a weird little scraper tool some jeweler screwdrivers oh that's actually no, that's like a pin vise. I think that's brass. That's kind of a neat thing. Uh, oh, that's got a sharp edge on it. You get the gist of it though. That's pretty much what's left in here. Oh, and a grease pencil. All right, let's take a look at the uh, three chainsaws I bought and then we'll wrap this one up. I'm not going to spend too much time on these chainsaws because I'm going to do a separate video at some point. I'll, I'll do like a will it run or something like that on these. But uh, these first two chainsaws I bought together off the same vendor. He had about, I don't know, six or seven chainsaws on the back of his trailer there. Uh, he had cleaned these all out of the same estate and uh, they're all pretty much uh, broken and in disrepair. But these caught my eye because I recognize that because they don't have the handle on the back, they only have the top handle that these are the more expensive, typically more expensive, uh, what are called arborists saw. Uh, they design like this so you can use them in close quarters like a, if you're up in a, a bucket or something like that or you're working in a tree. So this one, uh, they're both, all three of these are steels. And they may or may not have been steels in the other sense of the word depending on how bad they end up being. Um, but I paid 60 bucks for the pair. He wanted 45 each. I got him to take 60 for the pair, which this was first thing in the morning early. Uh, so uh, the fact that he was willing to work with me was at all was, you know, good for me, I think. This one is a, uh, the label is so faded that somebody wrote on here, kind of like traced it out, steel 015AE. Uh, AE stands for Arborist Expert Saw. I'm just kidding. I don't know what AE stands for. That's just... <laughs> A might be for Arborist, though. But what it's got going for it that is good is it appears to be complete. doesn't look like they stole a bunch of parts out of it. And it does have compression, so I don't know if it has spark. But And it's got the bar and chain on it. It's got some wear on it. But... And then the other one was this one. It doesn't even have a bar and chain on it, which doesn't bode as well for this one's condition. Uh, I love this older logo on these steel saws. This is the second one of these I've owned that has this kind of cool logo, which is the, 
you know, the rings of the tree. And so this is an 015 AV, which stands for Arborist Very Good Saw. <laughs> and again, other than the bar and chain missing, it is complete. And it also has compression. Then, later on in the day, I saw this saw was still at this other guy's spot. And uh, they were getting ready to pack up and leave. This one has a bar and chain still on it. Man, that chain's tight. I don't know why somebody would tighten it that much. but uh, So this one is a steel 015. Oh, by the way, note this one clearly says made in West Germany. So we know this is <laughs> pre-1980s, right? Before the fall of the wall. Anyways, uh, before the unification of Germany, or reunification of Germany, I should say. So this one is missing the spark plug. But I, if I put my finger in there and I pull it, it does have some compression. Whether it's enough compression to run, don't know. So uh, look forward to a series on uh, these three saws where I just kind of go through them real quick and evaluate them and determine whether or not they're going to be part saws or whether or not they could actually be repaired. So these three right here uh, bring my total of arborist saw that, saws that I've purchased uh, over the past two years to four. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this series. If you did, please hit the like button. And if you're not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing and sharing the video. Take care.